Welcome to Profile, the show that shares inspiring stories about ordinary people who are doing extraordinary things in this world. My name is Robbie, and our next guest today says that you ought to believe in yourself. It's the one thing that got him through all obstacles in his life and got him to where he is today. And he's here to talk about it. Please help me welcome Bradley Rury. How are you, sir? I'm doing great, Robbie. How are you? I'm doing amazing. Thank you for having me. Awesome. It's good to have you on our show. And I know you have an uh, inspiring, powerful story and experience that you want to share Most with definitely. everyone today. But first, I want to start off with Let's learn some more about you. All right, Bradley, where were you born and raised? I was born right here in Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, okay. My parents are of Jamaican descent. Okay. Um, growing up, um, you know, it was the Jamaican culture was definitely instilled in yes. from a young age. Food, everything. Mm -hmm. You know, my parents were very connected with the community which then brought us along and influenced us within the, the Caribbean community. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that was something that was, um, that helped me in a positive sense. Right. right. So, you know, thank God um, I was in a position where I didn't have to seek for a culture. I had one presented to me. What happened in your early days? High school, I went to a school in Vancouver called John Oliver Secondary. Um, shortly after graduation, I was working as a baggage handler uh -huh. for what was at the time Canadian Airlines. Um, in the midst of that, I got a fascination for aircraft and how they worked and the design and stuff like that. And uh, make a long story short, I ended up signing up for aircraft maintenance course at BCIT, which I got into. Upon completion of my course, in, unfortunately, Canadian Airlines was in the midst of being merged with Air Canada. So shortly after that, we had you know the effects of September 11th, which then crashed the whole airline industry. And I ended up getting laid off. So the opportunity arose in um, Abbotsford, a company called Cascade Aerospace, uh -huh. where it was a long drive from Vancouver. But you know what? You got to do what you got to do. Yeah. I did three years of my apprenticeship. Um, with them? With them, yeah. You went back to Canadian Airlines, right? After yes. That. Um, I got called back with the intention to go back into the maintenance aspect. So I was told I'd be on the baggage for about a month or two, and then I'd get my transfer over. Right. I took the leap, I went over, mm -hmm. and uh, shortly after that, with some restructuring in the company, um, their maintenance side, 800 people got laid off. They decided to outsource a lot of their heavy maintenance overseas. So I was back to square one again. Oh my. You know, at the time, my girlfriend at the time, yeah. um, we were expecting our first child. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking, I need to step it up, I need to do something, right? So yeah. that, um, I had a friend of mine, mm -hmm. he had recently got into the trucking industry. Mm -hmm. I used to help him out to drive around with him on ride. I kind of liked driving the big trucks, it was fun. Yeah. I started driving the truck on weekends, working the baggage thing, and trying, still trying to get my, yeah. my, my maintenance side going. Mm -hmm. And after I realized, you know, with the trucking, you know, my ambitions kind of led me to say, why not get a truck for yourself? I must admit though, one of the things that, um, mm -hmm. that really got me is that when I made the decision to go into the trucking, yeah. because of the relationship I had at Air Canada, and the rapport I had with the employees and the staff and mm -hmm. the management, I, I felt guilty giving my resignation. Okay. And, um, I wrote what I thought was the nicest resignation letter possible. <laughs> I didn't want to break any, you know, I didn't yeah. want to, you know, You're disrupt anything. Any yeah, exactly. You know, yeah. I had the letter in my hand and I called the supervisor. And, um, you know, went into his office. And the first question he looks at me, this is a gentleman that I've done many flights with. And you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. First question, he's like, what's your name again? And I'm thinking of all the years I've been here, you know? So I gave him, I told him my name. And then he's like, what's your employee number? So I gave him the employee number. And he punched it in his computer. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. How can I help you? And I gave him the, the resignation letter, and he took it, and he looked at it, and then he threw it down on the table. Goes, okay, anything else? <laughs> and that to me, I was like, wow, you know, like I expected something, you know, like, uh, you know, yeah. are you sure you want to do this, or we're gonna miss you? Nothing. He was just like, okay. So I completed my last shift, and it was about half an hour, or my last flight, and it was about half an hour before the end of the shift, and uh, I saw airport security and a supervisor come to the staff room and ask me. To follow them, they led me to the, the, the locker room, handed me a garbage bag to empty my stuff in the garbage bag. 
And then they took my, I had my belongings, then they escorted me into the domestic terminal where the carousels are where people grab. So we have hundreds of people there getting their bags and watching me get escorted by airport security. And um, I asked them, like, what's this all for? And at the end of the day, it was a, a standard procedure. But I looked at it as an embarrassment and uh, a disrespect to me. You are being kicked out of here. Exactly. That's the point in my life where I said, you know what? I don't think I'll ever work for anybody again. At the yes. same time, you know, if I do become a business person, I'm going to make sure I never deal with my staff the way how I was dealt with that day. And, yeah. You know, just like everything else, I use that as fuel to push me to, to do, to progress and to achieve. And that's what led into the trucking field. Your first business yes. as an owner-operator yes. of a trucking, yes. right? And you said you were working with... Um... A company called Quick as a Wing Curb. Nice. Yes. Yeah, so. I knew nothing about trucking business. I knew nothing about business. <laughs> right. But you know what? Yeah. I had I had a heart and a determined heart, and I said, you know what? I'll figure it out. And yeah. Off I went. I made many mistakes, but you learn from them. You right. know what I mean? And you gain and you grow and you know you progress in it as, as you go ahead. The thing with the trucking business, it takes a lot of time. Hours are anywhere from ten to fourteen hours. Right. Um, I had a young family. As I said, I had a son at this point. You yeah. know, um, he was in my care at the time, and I was. It was difficult balancing Work. being a father mm -hmm. and working. And it came to the point where I really just had to make a decision on what was more important for me. Another underlying passion I had was barbering, which right. I kind of did on the side. You know, yes. so I said, you know what? I was driving by this place, and um, I saw this place, and it was all like boarded up, and you know. I kept saying, hmm, that would be a good spot to put a barbershop. But once again, that fear within you. Mm -hmm. I'm like, but I can't afford it. I can't do it. What if it doesn't work, you know? Yeah. And I had a friend of mine just come up to me. He goes, you know what? And he walked up to me and says, here. And he handed me a large amount of money. And he says, start your business. Believe in you. Believe in me. And I, I think at the time. In yourself. Exactly. And I think he believed in me yeah. more than I believed in myself at the time, you know? Right. There was the, the, the doubt, you know? Right. But just kept pushing through. I had a lot of mentors. One of the mentors, a gentleman named Douglas Banner. Mm -hmm. He's a barber. He owns um, Salon Supreme. Okay. One of my biggest, biggest, biggest mentors. Saw the space, helped me kind of design what we're going to do with it and what he thought would be beneficial. And, you know, I had a lot of help from the community. Nice. Yeah. And what's the name of the business? Island Vibes Hair Studio and Accessories. Nice. Is it still operational? Still up and running. Still going. Still going. There's an interesting story about this business mm -hmm. that you told me about. You said it gives you the opportunity to show, to bring out something in you, how much you love and care for people. Definitely. Because while you're there, you're not just cutting here, mm -hmm. but you're having conversations. Mm -hmm. You advise. You talk about counseling, mentoring, and all of those things. Definitely. Tell us about that. You know, in the earlier days when I started um, Island Vibes, mm -hmm. you know, we didn't have a whole lot of, it wasn't as busy you know, as say it is now. Mm -hmm. There was days when, you know, especially during the week, I'd be there the whole day and maybe cut one head for the whole day. You know, the rest right. of the day, my mind's, you know, spinning. But the area where my shop is in, it's um, in Wally, in, in Surrey. So there's a lot of people in the area, drug addicts, people that are homeless, stuff like that. I remember one day, one day a guy came in. And you could tell it was obvious that he was, you know, had some sort of an addiction issue. And um, I started cutting his hair. As I started cutting his hair, we started talking, started conversating, and he kind of told me his story and how he ended up where he's at and the experiences in his life. After that conversation, it opened my eyes. It it, it gave me a different perspective yes. on a lot of people that, that face um, issues with addictions and things like that. When I saw how his face brightened up and how he just was so, he couldn't believe that I actually gave him a haircut, like, didn't charge him, didn't... didn't and you made you know? him look good at the same I time. I made him look good, but it, more than what I made him do, it made him feel better about himself. That impacted my brain. And then I find over the, the next coming weeks, I just started calling people in off the street because that was a way for me to distract my brain from my fears. Mm -hmm. And it was a way for me to kind of make other people feel better. They would come in. It became a point where they knew me. I walked on the street and be like, hey, Bradley. And I'm like looking around and... I'm not going to lie, I'm bad with names. <laughs> so I wouldn't remember all of it, but they remembered me, you know? And it just, you know, over there, it transpired to, to, to youth. Youth would come in and I just start talking to them, you know? When you realize that um, 
more people kind of look up to you than you expect. You know, you start talking to youth. Um, I had some clients, and he, he he started a foundation called the Game Ready Foundation, right. which is kind of deals with kind of at-risk at youth and youth that's within the system, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You know, we go down there and spend a couple hours and just cut kids here for free. But right. it's like you look at, once again, how it boosts their confidence and how they relate to you. And even sitting there, they would share things with us as their barbers mm-hmm. that they wouldn't even share with their counselors or their parents or their foster parents. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And we started becoming, like, impacting these kids you know i realized over the years you know barbering is not just about the haircut it's it's a lot about how you conversate how you communicate with the, with your your clients and the effects that you can have on them how is that going is that program still in effect program is still in effect still um, due to covid restrictions we of haven't course. done as much of the of the on-site um, mm-hmm. cut, cutting but we're looking to start it back up hopefully in the new year nice all right I'm not sure if it's COVID was the reason, but mm-hmm. you you pivot again, mm-hmm. right? After a while, you said you still like to lo- to mm-hmm. help people, mm-hmm. but you you say to yourself you mm-hmm. still have a bigger goal, mm-hmm. right? Yes. Tell us about that. Um, yeah, for years I always had in the back of my brain I wanted to um, venture into real estate. I decided to you know take that leap and just add to my portfolio. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, so I signed up uh, UBC, Sardar School of Business, in 2018. Mm-hmm. And eventually in 2020, I made it to where I walked away with that you know, certificate certificate in my hand. And nice. I've been uh, doing it just over a year now, mm-hmm. um, practicing real estate. And, you know, it's, it's a learning process. Every day you're in there, you're learning new stuff. You're learning how to deal with people, how to deal with contracts, and, you know, so many different aspects mm-hmm. of it. Um, it's a learning process. Yes. But it's, it's, I love learning. That's the thing. So it's just one more thing I want to add to my portfolio. Looking back at your 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 journey, yes. What would you have changed? I'll be honest with you, I wouldn't change anything. Nothing. I've made good choices. I've made bad choices. Mm-hmm. I've made. I've won and I've lost. It's it's a part of life. But when I combine everything that I've done and all the experiences I've had together, it's what made me who I am today. You talk about when you were working with the airlines and how much you value the company, your work, and your responsibility to them, your relationship and all of that. And at the end of the day, they let you go in such a way that made you feel like you were no body. What was your takeaway from that? And what advice do you have for people who are in a job today? Should, should they value their job as much as you did? or How should they see your job I believe that um, as humans Mm -hmm. a lot of us once again due to fear Mm -hmm. give the job more value than we give ourselves yes the job you have provides income provides a home daily daily living and stuff like that but you don't understand that a lot of people don't understand that without you you cannot go to that job without you without you being secure within yourself you cannot even put in a full effort in that job. I think people need to start valuing themselves, learning how to value themselves, um, t- to create strength within yourself so that when obstacles do come your way, you know how to maneuver yourself around them or get through them or deal with them in whatever way it is necessary. Mm-hmm. When you walk away from that job, walk mm-hmm. out of that building, mm-hmm. what are the things that you recognize you need to change in yourself to value yourself more to appreciate yourself more i learned to stop fearing i learned to start demanding that respect and also anything i feared i made a promise to myself that i would conquer is what i went for and the the biggest mistakes people would make is whenever there's an obstacle or a fear Mm -hmm. they want to go around it or avoid it worst thing they could do you can never avoid obstacles in life. There are always, no it's matter what aspect, back. no matter what aspect in life, it's going to, you're going to have obstacles. Mm-hmm. You can have a relationship, there are going to be obstacles. You can have a job, there's going to be obstacles. And the trick to it is to learn how to deal with the obstacles, not run around them or run away from them. And the funny thing is, even if you take on the obstacle, you don't always win. Mm-hmm. But the fact that you took it on, at least attempted, is something that we need to learn to be proud of. And it makes you a stronger, better person. It makes you much stronger. It might hurt. It might be angry. It might cause many different emotions that make you feel uncomfortable. 
but those emotions is going to mold you to become a harder rock. It's like you compact and compact. That makes you tougher. You work with youth, mm -hmm. and you recognize one of the things you you find is that they have an identity issue. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. am I being my best self? What's wrong with me? Mm -hmm. What should I change? Mm -hmm. What advice do you have for those people? Be you. Mm -hmm. Don't be what you think somebody wants you to be. Yeah. Be the person that you know within your heart you need to be. Because I believe that we all have an inner soul that tells us what's right and what's wrong. But a lot of times as humans, or as we youth especially, doubt it. we doubt it or we think it's not cool. So it's easier to do what everybody expects of us to do. It's usually the negative image is what's seen as cool. Mm -hmm. When you're doing something positive, they don't see that as cool. You know. And because everybody wants to, you know, due to things like social media, mm -hmm. everybody wants to be seen, everybody wants to be heard. So the easiest way to do that for a lot of the youth is to do what they think or what they assume they should mm -hmm. do instead of doing what they know for sure is the right thing to do. All right, let's, let's get personal. All right, let's All do right. it. <laughs> you mentioned in 2004 you, you got your, your son. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. How is, how is your son doing? My son is doing well. Nice. Any more kids? Uh, two two additional daughters and a stepdaughter as well. So I have three girls. You know, you're running your barbershop today. You, mm -hmm. you are doing real estate. You mm -hmm. have a family. Mm -hmm. How do you balance things out? I'll be honest with you. There's no game plan. You you wake up every day. <laughs> it's, 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 it's a challenge. I'm not going to lie. It's, it is a challenge. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as parents, I think it's important to make time. Um, you know, in my earlier earlier years, I found that I spent more time focusing on making the money yeah. than making the time. And right. Don't get me wrong, I still haven't made the money, but I'm learning now that sometimes you have to put the money aside and put the time in. Because money you can make tomorrow, but the time you lost today, mm -hmm. you cannot gain back tomorrow. Well said. Well said. Right. Bradley, thanks for sharing your, your story with us. Thank you, man. Thanks for the, the grinding, the, the hustling. Mm -hmm. Never give up and believing in yourself. Most definitely. Yeah. And I also want to thank you for having me on this platform. You know, I've seen some, a lot of the people that you've brought on this show and that being on this very stage here mm -hmm. and um, what they're about. And I, I, I must honestly say I'm honored to be, even be considered to be part of that group. You know what I mean? So I really have to appreciate you and thank you for considering me and bringing me onto this platform and giving me the opportunity to share my story. Yeah. Do know though that you have a lot of people out there who believe in you and wanting to hear your story. You are here because people reach out to me and say, get that guy on your show, right? So here it is, yeah. here you are, and here's your story. And I hope, I hope they can hear my story and it well, at least at a minimum, give somebody something to think about. Yes. And those people that did believe in me and encouraged you to bring me onto the show, I'd like to thank them as well for for just believing in me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, uh, and is your good friend too, no? Walter? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Shout out to Walter. Thank you, Walters. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks again. Okay. Thank you. Right. And again, remember, believe in yourself and never give up on your dreams. Be who you are, be you, be true to yourself. Don't try to fit into other people's show and go after your dreams. I'll see you in the next episode. I'm Robbie and thank you for watching. Bye for now. Rock. <laughs>